Hello, friends. Benjamin is with you, and today I will tell you another heartbreaking story. On the 16th of December 2004, a Thursday, Bobby Jo Stinnett, a 23-year-old woman who was eight months pregnant with her first child, eagerly anticipated the arrival of her baby girl. She was born on December 4th, 1981, and graduated from Nottoway Holt High School in Graham, Missouri in 2000. Bobby, residing in Skidmore, Missouri, alongside her husband Zeb Stinnett, was a well-known and gentle person in the small farming town. Her passion for animals, particularly dogs and horses, was evident, and she operated a dog breeding business named Happy Haven Farms from her home. Specializing in the breeding of rat terriers, Bobby actively participated in dog shows and engaged in discussions within the online dog breeding community. Her business involved listing puppies for sale, and on December 15, 2004, she received an instant message from Darlene Fisher, a woman from Fairfax, Missouri, whom she knew from their interactions on the Ratter Chatter Forum. Over the preceding weeks, Bobby and Darlene had exchanged messages, bonding not only over their shared love for rat terriers, but also through their mutual experiences of pregnancy. Darlene informed Bobby of her interest in purchasing one of her puppies, leading to an agreement to meet the next day. Bobby made plans to meet Darlene and subsequently informed her mother, Becky Harper, that she would pick her up from work at 3.30 p.m. On the 16th of December, the scheduled day, Becky called Bobby at 2.30 p.m. to confirm the arrangement for picking her up from work, and Bobby reassured her. However, by 3.30 p.m., when Becky finished work, Bobby was nowhere to be found. Becky tried calling Bobby, but there was no response prompting her to walk to Bobby's house, which was just two blocks away from her workplace. Upon reaching the house, Becky noticed the front door was open. She entered and called out to Bobby without receiving a response. As she entered the dining room, she discovered a horrifying scene, her daughter lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Distressed, Becky immediately dialed 911, urgently describing the dire situation, mentioning that her daughter was eight months pregnant and it appeared as though Bobby's stomach had suffered a severe injury. Upon the arrival of the police, it was uncovered that Bobby's unborn baby had been forcibly taken from her womb, and the whereabouts and survival of the infant were unknown. Locating the perpetrator became an urgent priority, as there was a possibility that the baby was still alive. Regrettably, Bobby did not survive the brutal attack. Both Becky and Bobby's husband informed the police that Bobby was scheduled to meet a woman named Darlene, who expressed interest in purchasing a puppy. Besides that, they were not aware of any other visitors expected that day. Through a swift investigation, the police traced Darlene via text messages and IP information from the computer used for communication. It was revealed that the woman posing as Darlene was not named Darlene and did not reside in Fairfax. Her true identity was Lisa Montgomery, residing in Melvern. Lisa had driven from Melvern to Skidmore on the 16th of December and arrived at Bobby's house around 12.30 p.m. The police believed that the baby was taken between 2.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m. On the 17th of December, the police visited Lisa Montgomery's residence and her husband Kevin greeted them at the door. Upon entering, they found Lisa in the living room, cradling a newborn baby. The police informed Kevin and Lisa that they were investigating the murder of Bobby Joe Stinnett and inquired about the baby. Lisa asserted that it was her child, born at a women's clinic in Topeka. Seeking a private conversation, the police spoke to Lisa outside her home. She disclosed to them, with a request to keep this information from Kevin, that due to financial constraints, she hadn't actually given birth at the women's clinic, but at home. Lisa claimed she was alone during the birth in her kitchen, but had the phone numbers of two friends for assistance if needed. When questioned about the placenta, Lisa stated that she disposed of it in a nearby creek. While Lisa expressed a preference for discussing the matter further at the sheriff's office to maintain privacy, and the police agreed to her request. At the sheriff's office, Lisa confessed to the police that she had killed Bobby, extracted the baby from her womb, and abducted her. The baby was subsequently returned to Bobby's husband, who named her Victoria Joe Stinnett. 
Lisa was charged with kidnapping resulting in death. During Lisa's trial, the court learned that Lisa and Bobby had first met at a dog show in April 2004 and were both members of an online dog breeding community. When Bobby announced her pregnancy within the online community after discovering she was expecting, Lisa, also a member, became aware of the news. In the spring of 2004, around the same time, Lisa informed her family and friends that she was pregnant. However, what Lisa omitted to disclose was that she had a sterilization procedure more than a decade earlier, rendering her incapable of becoming pregnant. Over the next eight months, Lisa engaged in an elaborate deception, pretending to be pregnant. She went as far as wearing maternity clothes and acquiring baby-related items. Despite her sterilization, Lisa managed to convince her husband Kevin and her children that she was genuinely pregnant. On the other hand, her first husband and his wife, who were aware of Lisa's sterilization, accused her of dishonesty. In response, Lisa insisted that she would prove them wrong. In the court proceedings, it was revealed that on the 16th of December, when Lisa arrived at Bobby's house, she was carrying a sharp kitchen knife and had a white cord in her jacket pocket. Upon Bobby answering the door, Lisa requested to see the puppies she intended to purchase. Bobby fetched the puppies and brought them outside for Lisa to interact with. Shortly after, when Becky called for Bobby to pick her up, Lisa attacked her. Using the cord she had brought, Lisa strangled Bobby until she lost consciousness. When Bobby regained consciousness and resisted, Lisa tightened the cord, ultimately causing Bobby's death. Lisa then proceeded to cut into Bobby's abdomen with the kitchen knife, successfully removing the baby. After cutting the umbilical cord, Lisa departed the scene. Remarkably, the baby remained unharmed. During her journey, Lisa took measures to ensure the baby's well-being, clamping the umbilical cord and clearing mucus from the infant's mouth. Lisa had a car seat prepared in her vehicle for the baby. Upon reaching a parking lot near a women's clinic in Topeka, Kansas, Lisa contacted her husband Kevin, informing him that she had given birth. Kevin met her at the parking lot, and they named the baby Abigail. The following day, they went out for breakfast, proudly introducing their new baby, Abigail, to others. The prosecution contended that the tragic death of Bobby and the abduction of the baby were outcomes of a calculated and cold-blooded plan devised by Lisa to safeguard the falsehood she had presented to her friends and family. According to the prosecution, Lisa harbored a fear that her first husband, Carl Bowman, would expose her lie during their ongoing custody battle. Lisa was concerned that this revelation could adversely affect her position in court proceedings, so she felt compelled to acquire a baby as evidence to convince others that her pregnancy was genuine. The prosecution argued that Lisa deliberately deceived her family and friends about her pregnancy and meticulously planned the abduction of a baby to perpetuate the illusion. They asserted that Lisa's plan was methodically calculated and executed with precision. To conceal her identity, Lisa contacted Bobby using a fake name, attempting to ensure that the crime could not be traced back to her. Concurrently, she continued to inform everyone she knew that she was pregnant. Lisa went as far as purchasing a home birth kit and researching online how to perform a cesarean section. Sheriff Strong, who played a role in the case, remarked that the crime exhibited meticulous planning and Lisa persisted in lying until she was cornered. At one point, Lisa even attempted to implicate her own brother claiming he was with her during the baby's abduction. However, his verified alibi confirmed that this was yet another falsehood. The prosecution asserted that Lisa was embroiled in a custody dispute with her first husband, who, upon learning that she had informed her second husband, Kevin, about her pregnancy, doubted the veracity of her claim. Aware of Lisa's inability to conceive, he sent emails expressing his intention to disclose the purported lie to Kevin and exploit it during the custody proceedings. In response, Lisa, determined to prove him wrong, engaged in a series of actions that culminated in the tragic events. Less than a week before Bobby's death, on the 10th of December, 
Lisa's first husband formally filed a motion seeking a change of custody for the two minor children residing with Lisa. To support their case, the prosecution presented Dr. Dietz as an expert witness. This move was prompted by the defense's prior notification that they intended to pursue an insanity defense, asserting that Lisa was experiencing pseudosciasis. During the trial, Dr. Dietz provided testimony distinguishing between two phenomena commonly referred to as pseudosciasis. The first manifestation involves a woman genuinely and sincerely believing that she is pregnant. Typically, this belief ceases when the woman is presented with concrete evidence proving that she is not pregnant. Individuals experiencing this form of pseudosciasis are not considered mentally ill and do not harbor delusions. The second form of pseudosciasis, as described by Dr. Dietz, is associated with mental illness, primarily schizophrenia. In this condition, individuals grapple with delusions, specifically the delusion of being pregnant. Notably, the distinguishing feature of this form is the presence of a firmly held conviction. In contrast to the first example, even when presented with evidence contradicting the belief, individuals with this type of pseudosciasis do not accept it. They maintain a steadfast and unwavering belief in their pregnancy, indicative of the influence of mental illness. Dr. Dietz, in his expert opinion, concluded that Lisa did not suffer from pseudosciasis at the time of Bobby's death. He arrived at this conclusion based on his belief that Lisa did not sincerely believe she was pregnant. In court, Dr. Dietz explained his reasoning by highlighting several key factors. Firstly, Dr. Dietz noted that Lisa was well aware that she had undergone permanent sterilization, leaving no doubt about her reproductive capabilities. In previous pregnancies, Lisa consistently sought medical and prenatal care, a pattern that was notably absent during the period in question. As additional evidence, Dr. Dietz referred to an insurance application filled out by Lisa in September 2004, where she explicitly marked that she was not pregnant. Furthermore, Dr. Dietz emphasized that Lisa's behavior was inconsistent with delusional thinking. He explained that in cases of a delusion of pregnancy, individuals would consistently adhere to the same narrative and willingly disclose it, remaining impervious to persuasion or contradictory evidence. However, Lisa did not exhibit these characteristics, leading Dr. Dietz to reject the notion that she was experiencing a delusion of pregnancy. Lisa's case was marked by inconsistent and contradictory accounts regarding crucial details. Notably, her narratives varied concerning the sex of the fetus, whether she was expecting twins or a single fetus, and the method by which she intended to deliver. These discrepancies were evident depending on the audience with whom she spoke, suggesting a lack of consistency and reliability in her statements. Furthermore, Lisa provided conflicting versions of the location where she claimed to have given birth. Initially, she asserted that the birth occurred at a women's clinic, only to later change her account, stating that it took place at home. When confronted with her brother's alleged presence at Bobby's house during the incident, Lisa, upon realizing the inconsistency, asserted that she suffered from amnesia before and during Bobby's murder. Dr. Dietz concluded that Lisa malingered the 2004 pregnancy. The court heard that it wasn't the first pregnancy Lisa had faked. In the years following her sterilization procedure, Lisa claimed to have experienced multiple pregnancies, each with its own set of complexities. Lisa's history of feigned pregnancies dates back to 1994. Subsequent instances occurred in 2000 when, before marrying Kevin, she informed him of a pregnancy and expressed a desire for an abortion. Kevin provided her with $40, but there was no further discussion or evidence of a pregnancy. In 2002, Lisa again asserted she was pregnant, informing Kevin of supposed doctor's appointments, but denying him the opportunity to accompany her. However, her doctor testified that he had only treated Lisa for unrelated issues such as ankle pain and a cold, providing no prenatal care. Later, Lisa informed Kevin that the baby had died, and she claimed to have donated the body to science, adding another layer of deception to her history of false pregnancies. The defense's case centered around the defense of insanity, 
and it was their intention to call experts to testify in relation to Lisa's mental disease or defect. The court heard that Lisa had a troubled life. They argued that she had been subjected to physical and sexual abuse by her stepfather. At the age of 18, Lisa married her stepbrother, Carl Bowman, with whom she had four children before undergoing the sterilization procedure. Following their divorce in 1998, Carl remarried, and Lisa later married Kevin. To support their claim of insanity, the defense called upon expert witnesses, Dr. Ramachandran and Dr. Logan. Both experts diagnosed Lisa with multiple mental health conditions, including depression, borderline personality disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and pseudosiasis. Dr. Ramachandran provided testimony regarding pseudosiasis, characterizing it as a somatoform disorder where the patient develops a delusion of being pregnant. According to his testimony, this delusion is fueled by an intense desire to become pregnant, leading to hormonal changes that manifest in physical alterations consistent with pregnancy. Dr. Ramachandran held the perspective that Lisa was afflicted by an intense pseudosiasis delusion. During his testimony, he asserted his belief that Lisa was in a dissociative state when she committed the acts of killing Bobby and delivering the baby. Dr. Ramachandran suggested that the sexual abuse Lisa endured in her childhood made her susceptible to pseudosiasis. He argued that Lisa's engagement in internet searches and the purchase of baby-related items were indicative of her experiencing pseudosiasis. Additionally, Dr. Ramachandran expressed the view that Lisa was grappling with a profound mental disease or defect, rendering her incapable of fully comprehending the nature and quality of her actions. After five hours of deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous verdict, finding Lisa guilty of kidnapping resulting in death. The following day, she was handed a death sentence. The jury collectively determined that the government had successfully demonstrated, beyond a reasonable doubt, all statutory and non-statutory aggravating factors. The prosecution contended that these factors encompassed the crime being committed in an especially heinous or depraved manner, involving serious physical abuse to Bobby Joe Stinnett. The jury concurred with this argument, leading to Lisa's death sentence via lethal injection of pentobarbital at Terre Haute Prison in Indiana. Subsequently, Lisa found herself on death row within a federal prison in Texas designed for female inmates with specific medical and psychological needs. Throughout her incarceration there, she received psychiatric care. Lisa enlisted a new defense team in an attempt to have her death sentence commuted to life in prison. Their central argument revolved around the assertion that, given the harrowing abuse Lisa endured in her past, the imposition of the death penalty was unjust. They contended that the legal representation during her initial trial failed to fully disclose the extent of the profound hardships in Lisa's history, and that the defense presented was inadequate. The new defense team argued that, at the time of the crime, Lisa was in a psychotic state, detached from reality. Furthermore, they presented the case that Lisa's history of abuse began even before her birth, as she was born with fetal alcohol syndrome due to her mother's heavy drinking. The defense outlined specific instances of abuse, alleging that Lisa was subjected to physical beatings and that the mistreatment intensified when her mother remarried. They claimed that Lisa was sexually abused by her stepfather. Despite the efforts of her legal team, who argued that pressure and the threat of exposure from her first husband led Lisa to fabricate a pregnancy, their objections and appeals for her removal from death row were unsuccessful. The execution proceeded as scheduled. In Terre Haute, Indiana, Lisa underwent a lethal injection after a last-minute stay of execution was lifted by the U.S. Supreme Court. As the only female inmate on federal death row in the United States, she became the first female federal inmate to be executed by the government in 67 years. Before her execution, when asked if she wished to make a statement, Lisa declined. She was officially pronounced dead at 1.31 a.m. on January 13th, 2021. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.